Hello and welcome to episode 189 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 1st of August 2022. I'm Joe, and with me are Phelan. Ciao. Graham. Good evening. And Will. Hello. Let's get straight on with our discoveries then. Will. Bat. This is a slightly improved version of Cat by the looks of things. Yes, it's a cat clone with wings, as it describes itself. Um, And I was watching Wimpress's Twitch stream the other morning as I was getting on with some bits and bobs, uh, and he talked about it there. And it's packaged with his uh, DebGet tool, so it's dead easy to install, although it is also in the Ubuntu archive. And so it can do syntax highlighting. It's aware of certain file formats. It's aware of Git especially. So it can help like give you a visual diff of Git files. You can pipe things in and out of it. You can use a pager. You can dump it straight to the screen. It's just, yeah, just as effective as cat, but just that little bit easier because it gives you the highlighting and the colors and all stuff like that. So yes, well recommended. Thank you. You reminded me I had this installed and I totally forgot about it. Huh. Alias cat bat. <laughs> <laughs> it, just a, a tip for people. When I installed it with apt a long, long time ago, it made a file called Batcat. Mm. I don't know why it doesn't have bat, but yeah, I think that's used by something else in Debian. But um, yeah, Batcat is the command when it actually installs. All right, Phelan, what's Beej's Guide to Network Programming? This uh, takes me back to uni and all the projects that I never got done on time or working properly because I hadn't a clue what I was doing. And I wish I had this book. I know I brought up a uh, network book before, but this is a bit more maybe computer science-y version of it, but it's still written in a nice sort of way. And uh, for anybody that's interested in network programming, I think it's very well written. What exactly is network programming as opposed to networking? Well, it's it's right in the low level stuff. It's doing it's getting into all the different layers of the of the model and stuff. So it's you know helping you understand how those things work, not just using libraries to do them yourself, but actually getting nitty gritty and you know creating your own packets and stuff. Will it help me with WireGuard? No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it would, but uh, you'd have to invent your own encryption while you're at it too. Which you know that's always a great idea. I think so. I think so. Hmm. And you've also discovered a Linux command library, which has a website and an F-Droid app. Yeah, I have a terrible memory, and I don't know, these people who seem to be able to memorize lots of stuff off by the top of their head, they're clearly freaks, and I'm just not one of them. I constantly forget stuff. I think I can only remember about five things, and usually even remembering where I got the info for the thing is half the battle. But this is an excellent command. So you can install it on your phone as an F-Droid app. But there's also a, a website to go along with it. And it's got some really cool stuff like one-liners. Simple things you want to do with certain commands. You know, how to fix various input, how to get info out the system. Really helpful and useful, especially if you're starting off. It's a great way to get stuck into uh, CLI stuff. All right, Graham. Well, tangentially related to your Steam Deck discovery from a couple of weeks ago is Galaxy Buds Client. So, yeah, I don't particularly want to endorse buying a pair of um, Samsung Galaxy earbuds in the headphones. Bluetooth. Sorry. Exactly. That's my point. But they're often on sale. And because they're competing with Apple and Google, I think for the price you can usually get them on sale, they're pretty good headphones. And I've I've normally got a good pair of like sure in-ear monitors and I've had clips before. And they're not bad for like less than £100 typically. But the big problem, like Phelan's just um, alluded to with the Galaxy Bud earphones, is that you need their app on your phone and the to be able to configure them because you need to configure them, Phelan, I'm sorry. Boo. <laughs> and you need to configure them to do things like how you press, there's a button on it, and also the kind of equaliser mode, the sound mode, and for the noise cancellation and to be able to hear the outside sounds on the inside. Um, and do all the other kind of cool things with them. This is a very involved set of earbuds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, earbuds and, are typically like this. Um, and I, I use them a lot. I use them kind of casually and I use them with a the Steam Deck. And they've they've got a good bass response and it's a good, it's a good flattering sound for playing games, but also for just listening to music when you're out and about. But the app, it requires permissions to do everything you know it needs permissions to your contact list it needs permissions to your geolocation your biometrics (laughs) well why wouldn't your buds need to dial your granny (laughs) yeah it's horrendous and i don't allow it which means that you can't set anything on them which kind of massively restricts their use so galaxy buds client is an open source linux app 
stick it on your laptop, pair your headphones to your Linux machine, and you can configure all the same things that the official Samsung app does from a really neat Linux app. So everything, you can even see like the, the battery level in both headphones, you can even see your ear temperature, and um, lets you do all of that stuff. I think there's even, you can even locate your earbuds, you know, that the kind of stuff that, that the app does, you can do it all without giving Samsung any information. So you, I think if you see them on sale, you can buy them and uh, have a good conscience about not installing the Samsung app, which is exactly what I've done. And I think it's a brilliant little app. Is this run on your laptop and then that laptop has that config or does it kind of upload something to a firmware on the buds themselves? Yeah, it configures the buds. Oh, so the good. buds retain yeah, nice. the, the configuration from whenever the last time you use them. So Yeah, so you don't need to install it on your phone and then onto exactly, your laptop yeah. too. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So you just connect it to your phone then it'll have the same settings. And they're even working on reverse engineering the firmware on the buds. So, you know, they're in, in theory, there may be an open source version of the firmware, but wow. I think for the kind of price you can get them and the kind of quality they offer and the fact that you can do it without the Samsung app, it kind of gets around the failing factor. I know. I mean, I'm okay with that. I mean, you're making use of a of a product. That's good. Uh, what happens if one of the buds goes dead? The fact that they both have their own battery, like, does that mean you, you get mono then at one point or do they both die? No, you can you still use one. Wow. Um, but maybe you could make a necklace out of the other one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me, Graham, that you are that classic Linux user from about 15 years ago that would just buy a random laptop and then just hope that Linux would work on it and then have to spend days and days and days finding workarounds for everything. Uh, you, you just tend to just buy just all the wrong shit and then have to find all of the <laughs> hacks. I'm like the, um, if you've seen the film The Martian, I just like to hack the shit out of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah. If it looks nice and it's cheap, I'll buy it. <laughs> well, so how does that explain the Mac then? Looks nice is very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm still running macOS. I'm sorry, Phelan. <sighs> All right. Well, my discovery is that lineage and custom ROMs generally are a pain in the ass. So we did actually do a whole episode of Linux After Dark about this, episode 17 back in uh, May. But uh, recently, I got a OnePlus 5 very cheaply off uh, Gumtree and installed lineage on it. And uh, that was all fine. And I, I got it all set up for my wife to use because she's got a 3T, which is getting a bit long in the tooth now. And, no, uh, isn't it? It's fine. No, it's, uh, it's a shit old phone for him. It's fine. No, it is a great phone, but hers is, uh, I don't know, it's time for her to have an upgrade anyway. And um, in trying to get the G cam, the, the Google cam, you need to have a Magisk module for that, which was all pretty straightforward stuff. And, you know, I, I got all out of way working and it was all fine. And then uh, I, I set all our stuff up, copied all the WhatsApp history onto it and everything. And I was like, oh, let's just do a quick OTA update before I give it to you. And I uh, did that. Yeah, that's all going fine. I gave it to her, show up the camera. It's really laggy. Front camera doesn't work. I was like, what? I did that with the Magisk module. And then, oh no, I've lost root. And so I had to then reflash Magisk onto it. And it's just so frustrating. I mean, okay, you could say that's slightly edge case, wanting to have root and this camera that you don't approve of failing, I know, the, the G-cam thing. Your flood fill camera that you get there, it's like Microsoft Paint has attacked your picture to make it look better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to see uh, a side-by-side of the 3T running the, the proper camera that we use versus the shit lineage one. Well, you can compare anything to a black JPEG and make it look better. <laughs> exactly. But... Uh, yeah, I, it just really makes me feel like I'm getting too old for this shit. But I do enjoy the challenge of it. But uh, so I, this is a, a moan and also a, a cry for help. Like, has anyone else got a OnePlus 5 and has uh, experienced the same issue? If you have, please get in touch. Show at latenightlinux.com or just tweet me at Joe Ressington because I just want to be able to just give her this phone and then take the 3T and have that as like a spare phone. Because when I had the disastrous upgrade of my um, OnePlus 6, which I talk about in that Linux After Dark episode, I was just left with no phone. I had to dig out a, a Nexus 5 to use, which was painful. And so it occurs to me, I've got a pile of laptops. So if any of my computers die, I can just get up and running really quickly. But I just didn't have a decent backup phone. And so I thought, well, I got a good price on this OnePlus 6. So the 3T can be the backup phone. But... Otherwise, I'm just going to have to have the 5 as the backup phone. 
if I can't fix this issue. So someone who knows about it, please help me. All right, Graham, you've got a bonus pick, which is related to Wills. Uh, yeah, related in the, um, the naming because it's called Battop. And this is actually also slightly linked to the Steam Deck because it's a battery consumption monitor for the command line, for the terminal. And um, so it's great on the Steam Deck because it consumes so much power, but also obviously laptops. And it's even more powerful, I think, than any of those little battery monitors you get in a typical panel because it'll give you a scrolling histogram of consumption and peak voltages and temperatures and also consumption for your battery while you're running whatever you're running. If you're charging, it'll tell you the charging wattage, how long it's going to take to charge the battery. If you're just running off the battery, it'll tell you how long you've got left, exactly kind of the kilowatt hours or the watt hours you've got left in your battery. And when you're doing things that you might not necessarily think of taking up that much power, it's really useful to fire it up, like playing a game, for example, seeing that the GPU is using, you know, 15 watt hours of battery. It's a really cool little tool. Uh, I found it really useful and much more informative than kind of cl even clicking on the battery icon on a KDE desktop. Well, more on that in the feedback segment, <laughs> because it might well be lying to you <laughs> or not lying to you, but it might be uh, not telling you the whole truth because it doesn't know the whole truth. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Um, that top isn't specific to the Steam Deck. In fact, the project hasn't been updated for a while, but it's still a cool utility. But one thing the Steam Deck overlay does tell you, which I found interesting, is when you're charging, you can see exactly how powerful the charging power is. You know, so loads of PSUs kind of say they're compatible with, I don't know, 15 or 20 or 40 watts of charging power, for example. Um, and it seems I get a lot less than that most of the time with the Steam Deck. And it, it's the same with Battop, that Battop can give you that information without the Steam Deck overlay. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. Traditional endpoint security tools can make your workplace feel like a surveillance state, turn users and the IT team into adversaries, and ultimately drive your employees to work on unsecured personal devices. It doesn't have to be this way. Collide is a device security solution built around honest security. Their philosophy is that employees aren't your biggest security risk, they're your biggest allies, and your relationship with them should be based on transparency and informed consent. Collide works by notifying your employees of security issues via Slack and giving them step-by-step -step instructions on how to resolve them themselves. For IT and security teams, Collide provides the right level of visibility for Mac, Windows and Linux devices. It can answer questions about your fleet's security that traditional MDMs can't. You can meet your security goals without compromising your values. Visit collide.com slash late night Linux to find out how. If you follow that link, they'll hook you up with a goodie bag just for activating a free trial. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash late night Linux. On to a bit of admin then. First of all, thank you everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join them, you can go to latenightlinux.com slash support. And remember, for $10 or more per month on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed that includes this show, Linux After Dark, and Linux Downtime. And if you want to get in touch, you can email show at latenightlinux.com. Let's do some feedback then. And we had two more people take up our coding challenge. The first one was from Mike, and he says it uses plain vanilla PHP along with some jQuery and Tailwind CSS to pull in the feed, pass it out, and display the discoveries. But the extra fun part was then following the links to pull the meta description from each link. It's not perfect, but here's my stab at it. And uh, it looks pretty bloody good to me, so well done, Mike. But it's PHP. Uh. <laughs> oh, oh, failing. There's nothing wrong with a bit of PHP. Ah, isn't there, though? <laughs> I I, it's very good. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm only trolling you. Okay, well, Dimitar also sent a link to um, Joe RSS thingy. And he said, the script should not overwrite the markdown files in the directory. So if necessary, files can be manually modified. By design, it looks for links under the discoveries paragraph and excludes the rest. And in his test, it found 143 links and managed to annotate most of them. It couldn't find a description for 22 and three produced an error. And he says, I hope you find it useful. And of course, any feedback is welcome and appreciated. See, Mike, that's Python. Python's a much better language than PHP. <laughs> 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 Python too, but anyway, we'll overlook that. <laughs> yeah. Well, either way, I can't believe that three people did this. That's ah, brilliant. Yeah, it's mad. So thank you, everyone. And I have, of course, joking about not liking your code. 
I mean, also, they're genuinely useful resources. I know that I know. there are, I, but I've forgotten. I've forgotten them, like, from last week. I'm thinking, God, this is brilliant, this list. Oh, <laughs> he's really good at picking stuff out. <laughs> this is, I can maybe use them for next time's discovery. <laughs> yeah, well, eventually we'll be able to just recycle them. No one will notice. <laughs> Except that now they've made these tools, people yeah, will notice. Yeah. <laughs> So Emil got in touch with his two cents on VC funding in open source. Having worked in two different large software companies, though not proper VC money pits, I disagree that there would be no useful software left in the rubble after their inevitable collapse. Yes, most business logic is useless outside the company, but there are many internal tools and handy packages from my previous job that I would love to have access to in my new position. Also, software is reused all the time. In some cases, way too much, looking at you, NPM packages containing three lines of code. <laughs> Having all packages now hidden in private repositories of big companies accessible to all would be very helpful. Not all projects gain traction, but those that do can become very important for the open source community. A good compromise between open source and proprietary for many companies could be to have the business logic proprietary and share all of the surrounding tools as open source. There are more important things we could have done with the resources we have as a world than we have burned on the likes of Uber during the last decade. But maybe, like the internet infrastructure got a lot of financing during the dot-com boom and bust, there will probably be something useful in the rubble this time around as well, especially in software that is open source. Yeah, I suppose the point there is that it doesn't have to be a binary situation. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think that is something we might have overlooked there, that yeah, a lot of what they do might be useless if it's open source, but then a lot of it could be useful. And so they should be encouraged to open source as much as they can. All right, Phelan, it's time to troll you again. You can read out Jacob's email about KDE. <laughs> <sighs> right. <laughs> I'm starting to move to KDE as a tiling script Bismuth seems to be doing quite well with Wayland recently. Was using Sway before this, and I'm hoping to do a whole integration bit with KDE and my phone get that magical seamless experience that Apple's so happy to keep to themselves. However, as much as I want to love KD Connect, it's kind of shit at some things still. Blasphemy! Burn the witch! <laughs> For example, it takes an ungodly amount of time to load my text messages. Oh God, well done, Grandad. <laughs> and I have to re-obtain them each time I connect. Well, maybe your network is shit. Another improvement I could see is getting RCS to work well, although I wonder if the KDE team is just waiting Google out on that one to see if they'll cancel it as well. I'm curious if there's just still a lot to be done, or worse, a lot that's just unattainable. I think you should stop using the Windows version. <laughs> <laughs> Who uses text messages? What is this? Americans. What the fuck is RCS? Is this some magical, like, SMS V2 that we don't have because it's shit anyway, because it's still SMSs? I don't know. Essentially, yes. It's like a new standard that uh, Google is pushing. But the bottom line is that people who use iPhones, which is most young people in America, don't use WhatsApp, don't use Telegram, don't use Signal, don't use third-party messaging applications. They use iMessage, which is sort of like a weird mixture between old school SMS and a messaging system. We'll use an iPhone. Do you understand the difference between the different colored ticks? Uh, I don't care, so I guess not. Okay, well, I don't use an iPhone, but uh, I'm down with the kids. I don't believe you, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, I used to be with it, and then they changed what it was. <laughs> anyway, but when it comes to iPhones, if you've got an iPhone and I've got an iPhone and I send you a text, it goes through Apple and the delivery tick mark is uh, one color. It's either blue or green. I can't remember which is which. If I've got an iPhone and you've got an Android phone or any other non-iPhone, then it sends it via SMS and then it shows up as a different color. And so Apple have built in this system to effectively ostracize and uh, single out people who haven't got an iPhone, and especially in group chats and stuff, they are the, the odd one out. They can't afford an iPhone. They're not cool. They don't have an iPhone. So it's Apple being a proper shower of bastards. But as a result of that, I think that's the reason why the likes of WhatsApp and Telegram are not very popular in the US. And as a result, SMS in KDE is more relevant to them. Do you get charged per message for this RCS thing then? 
I'm not sure about RCS, but my understanding is that most plans in America charge you to receive oh, a text. Oh, Jesus Christ. That is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Why would it work that way around? Some historical... I mean, look at just generally telecoms in America. I'm sure we'll get loads of emails about this, but like, you know, you only have one broadband provider there and they charge just ridiculous money for it. And same with mobile as well. In fairness, I have had the joy of setting up a fair few Astra service in the US and it's always just a distinct joy dealing with telcos. I do love it. So anyway, I think the the problem may be that a lot of the people working on the KDE stuff are in Europe and therefore don't tend to send that many SMSs as a rule. And so that may explain some of the issues here. But don't quote me. Yeah, it does seem that it's something slightly different as a protocol as well. I mean, I guess we could always find out. Maybe we can ping the developer and not and find it and see if we can get somewhere with that. I don't know. Yeah. Not promising anything, but hey. But yeah, the, the solution is just convince everyone you know to use Signal instead. That's really easy to make people change how they uh, behave. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. Go to linode.com slash late night Linux, support the show, and get $100 free credit. From their award-winning support, offered 24-7, 365 to every level of user, to ease of use and setup, it's clear why developers have been trusting Linode for projects both big and small since 2003. Deploy your entire application stack with Linode's one-click app marketplace, or build it all from scratch and manage everything yourself with supported centralized tools like Terraform. And check out their managed MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB databases that allow you to quickly deploy a new database and defer management tasks like configuration, managing high availability, disaster recovery, backups, and data replication. Simple and fast to deploy with secure access, their flexible plans include daily backups. So go to linode.com slash late night Linux, create a free account, and you'll get $100 in credit and support the show. That's linode.com slash late night Linux. All right, well, Lawrence or possibly Laurent got in touch about battery health. The only place where Apple really lies is the iPhone battery health. Overly optimistic, but in general, lithium-ion batteries lose permanent capacity if kept at 95% to 100% for prolonged periods, especially at higher, higher than 20 degrees C temperatures. Regarding battery capacity and state of charge, claiming 0.1% accuracy is unwarranted precision. The measurement systems on a laptop are not accurate enough. Moreover, battery capacity is not a single number as it depends on the discharge rate and the battery age. Battery management on monitoring is complex and a non-trivial subject. The reason that Apple informs the user that the MacBook is at 100% charge even when it's not is because behind the scenes it tries to keep the battery at a lower state of charge to improve battery life and reduce battery ageing. But if macOS were to tell the user the technical truth, then Apple support would have a million calls per day of people asking why their battery was not charging to 100%. Um, Bonafides, I've worked as a hardware design engineer for nearly 25 years, not specifically on batteries, but have done work in that area as well as a general interest. I think that's a really interesting point, and thanks for emailing in. It's so true that it's just much more complicated than the picture that our little apps and terminal commands tell us. Me personally, I like to kind of run them and run them for a while and see how it feels and see how things go so that I can kind of spot patterns and then get some kind of indication of how things are going or whether something out of the ordinary is going wrong. But I try not to make too many assumptions on actual battery life because you can never really predict. Yeah, and my strategy for laptops is to either use them or charge them. And I, that may just be superstition or whatever, but I've got a laptop that I've had for well over a year and it tells me that it's still 100% health. I now doubt the veracity of that claim by the various software that tells me that. But that's my rule. Like either it's plugged in and 100% and running off mains and I'm using it, or it's off and charging, or it's not plugged in and I'm using it. So use or charge is my general rule of thumb. And that seems to have done well for me. I don't stick to that rule with my phone for some reason, because phones I I see as something that don't last as long somehow, which is bad really, but that's just the reality. Like you can keep a laptop for 10 years easily, whereas a phone after 10 years, certainly historically, it's just not much use, mostly because of software support. 
I think this is where they should maybe have a newer symbol for this rather than assuming people just want to be fed shite and kept in the dark. Maybe they should educate them somewhat. Give them, you know, like an O for optimal or something like that. And, uh, you know, help people along understanding more rather than just saying, no, you don't get to know about why it's at this state. I don't know. Something that Apple does out of the box, which Linux should do out of the box and doesn't, so plug for TLP here, is prevent you from charging... Well, it learns for your, your activity, and if you are plugged into the mains all the time, it charges your battery to like less than 80% and holds it there. You can do that with TLP on Linux, and I think it should really be installed out of the box on most distros. For example, on my ThinkPad, I have it set to charge to no more than 50%, and it just holds it there. So if I look at my battery stats, the cycle count, the, the times at which it's been fully charged, discharged, and then fully charged again, is like three, and I've had this laptop for about a year. So yes, check out TLP. We talked about it, well, a while ago in one of our finds of the fortnight. Check one of those lists. Do you know if that is firmware dependent on the laptop itself? I do not. I think that there is some ThinkPad magic in there somewhere. Yeah, because I don't think it would work for mine. I'm I'm actually going to try it. I'm going to try it for next show just to see yeah, yeah. if it works. Because uh, I've got a Dell Sputnik 2 the, uh, from quite a while back. And it's actually in still really good nick. And the battery lasts maybe three hours still at this point, which is quite impressive for a laptop that's from 2014. But uh, it'd be interesting to see because uh, that's exactly what I do. Like the, if you find a, a mobile phone battery, it'll generally be charged at fifty percent when you get it delivered, mm. because that's the best place to let it sit for a long time if it's in storage. So, I will try that then. TLP. I think that when it comes to IT stuff in general, there are three areas that are just total fucking witchcraft. Printing, scanning, and battery health. Oh. No one really understands how any of that works. I jinxed myself last time talking about my printer. I think it was in the Telegram channel. My printer blew up. The one from 2007 I had to get a new one. Jesus Christ. Well, all I can say is Canon provide Linux drivers. Good boys, Canon. I still have to use my old Mac to do any sort of printing. It doesn't work on a new Mac. Windows, Linux just does not want to work. I can't remember what make it is now might be a Canon. And uh, it just just doesn't work with anything apart from my old Core 2 Duo MacBook Pro that's running uh, 10.7 Lion. And it just works <laughs> flawlessly on that. So it's just USB stick into that. USB printer. Jobs are good in. Are your printers like 10 years old or something? Oh, this must be 15 years old. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Most modern printers support driverless printing, which is effectively a streamed PDF and mm. the, the new stuff shouldn't need a lot of drivers. Yeah, but this is an old black and white laser printer that has been an absolute workhorse mm. for me. Mm. And I just don't want to chuck it out and create e-waste. And it also, as I said, is a nice excuse to keep that old Mac around. All right, Paul said, I've just discovered goatcounter.com and I thought it was worth sharing. I recently set up a personal blog on GitHub pages and didn't want to go anywhere near Google Analytics and the number of page views I was expecting didn't warrant self-hosting or paying. I'd consigned myself to not knowing how many people were visiting my site until I came across goatcounter.com by Martin Ternoy. I don't know how you say that, sorry. It's open source, free, and Martin hosts the back end, and it's easy to use. It's minimal in what it records, but it's perfect for my usage. Ironically, having decided that I didn't want to pay for analytics, I've set up a regular donation on Martin's GitHub page, as it's exactly what I was looking for. That sounds like an all-round FOSS win. Well done, Paul. And yeah, I've never bothered with Google Analytics because it just seems like really intrusive. Yeah, same. I know there's a few other open source uh, solutions for this, but if it's really simple and just gives you basic stats, that might be really handy. So yeah, good discovery, Paul. Well done. Right, well, with that, we'd better get out of here then. We'll be back next week when, honestly, we have no idea what's going to happen because that's far too far away. So uh you just have to download it and see. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later.